All right, awesome, and we are live. Um, welcome to the Cool Data Project Show. I am Kristen Kerrer, a developer advocate for Comet, where with one function, um, you can make your model training runs reproducible. And this is the Cool Data Project Show, where I talk to practitioners in MLDL and AI about cool projects that they're working on and their approach. Um, I'm super excited to have Nicola on with us today, who is going to tell us about how she is using GitHub Actions for one of her Shiny apps. Um, so Nicola, could you please introduce, our, introduce yourself and tell us a bit about um, Jumping Rivers? Yeah, of course. Hello. Um, so I'm Nicola Rennie, and I'm a data scientist at Jumping Rivers. Uh, so Jumping Rivers are a data science consultancy company based in the UK. Um, and we do sort of data science consultancy, sort of uh, a lot of the work we do is sort of building shiny dashboards. Um, and we also do sort of data engineering. So we're a full service partner of our studio, so we can help sort of get your shiny apps into production as well as building them for you. Um, and the other thing we do um, that's a big part of my job is training courses. So we also teach people how to use R and Python so that you can also maintain your shiny apps yourself. It's not sort of we build them and I will look after them forever. We sort of help people look after the products we build them. Oh, awesome. So it sounds like you're the right person to be talking to about Shiny Apps. Um, so I know you have a demo for us. Do we want to jump in and just show people what, what it is we're talking about? Yeah, of course. I will just share my screen. So yes, so this is, the shiny app I built. Um, I'll start by saying this is one of the sort of simplest and I would almost go as far as to say boring shiny apps I've built because it was sort of, this project for me was not about building a fancy shiny app. It was about the automation and, and learning how the GitHub actions and sort of automating those updates work. Um, so the idea of this shiny app is that um, it displays tweets that I have liked on Twitter um, that have a link to something else. Um, so quite often when you're browsing through Twitter, I see something that I'm like, oh, that might be useful for work. And then you like it and then you can never find it again. Um, so this was, let's pull that data into a Shiny app. Um, and the key point here is these, these sort of links. So if someone's linked to a blog post or a GitHub repository with something that I have, I've thought was interesting, then it sort of pulls this into the Shiny app and it filters all my tweets. So these are specifically tweets relating to R or Python or data science. And it gives me all these links um, in one place. So that's the sort of idea um, of the Shiny app is a, a table of tweets about data science with links to resources um, that I would like to look at at a later date. Awesome. And so um, what was your motivation for the project? It sounds like this was a personal project or did you do this for yes. work? Okay. This was um, so this, project. yeah, this was mostly a personal project. So I'd actually seen the idea on Twitter of all places of someone had sort of done this idea of let's um, use a Twitter API to get the data on tweets that you've liked um, and pull them into a shiny app. And that's great. But the, the problem with that example I saw was it was sort of like a snapshot. So it was like all of the tweets you've liked up to the point where you built that shiny app. Um, but if you actually want this to be a sort of useful app, then it needs to be automatically updating and pulling that data in on a regular basis. Um, and when I was kind of thinking through that's a way I could improve that, I thought, well, this is something that GitHub Actions could probably use for the idea of GitHub Actions as sort of running code while you sleep. Um, and, and GitHub Actions is something that I've sort of been using for quite a while without completely understanding how it works. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if you are an R user, um, you might be familiar with the use this package, um, which has a bunch of sort of functions that make it make sort of package development a lot more user friendly. So one of the functions in the use this package is sort of use this, use GitHub Actions. And what it does is it creates that GitHub Actions file for you and it sort of keeps it in, in your GitHub repository. And then when you push your code um, to GitHub, you sort of, you get a nice little green tick or you get a red cross um, that says, did your code pass some tests or not? And it's, I've been using that for a while because it's nice to make sure that your code works. 
but sort of like I didn't really understand what was going on in those GitHub Actions files in the background. Um, and I've always kind of thought, well, this is something I should probably learn how it actually works. And I thought this is a nice opportunity to to do that and to kind of practice more almost on the sort of data engineering side of things. I've been working as a data scientist um, for a while, but quite often we're sort of building the products. We're not necessarily the, the people that are getting them out there into the world. So this was sort of let's get some experience of going from nothing from the very start right up to something that's out there working on its own that works and I don't need to touch it anymore. Nice. And could you just tell us what GitHub Actions is? So GitHub Actions is, it can do quite a lot of different things. The, ten, the things that I use GitHub, the way that GitHub Actions work is that you define a script of some things that you want to run. And then you can set that to run, for example, when you push your code to main, or you can set it to run on a schedule. So you can run a, a particular script every day at 8 a.m. But the idea is that it's sort of, it's running on GitHub. So you're, it's not something you particularly have to do locally. It's something that GitHub will do automatically for you. Mm -hmm. um, so in this project, I had two separate GitHub Actions files. So the first one was to automatically deploy the app. So essentially, most of the time, previously when I've been building Shiny apps for personal projects, is you build the app locally and then you sort of manually deploy it. You sort of click that button and it, it mm -hmm. sends it um, off. Um, but I store most of my code on GitHub um, anyway. So the idea is you can create a GitHub action where every time you push your code to main, it automatically redeploys. So mm -hmm. I no longer have to worry about the deployment after I set up that GitHub action. It's sort of one of those manual kind of tedious tasks that I no longer have to deal with and GitHub will do that automatically. Mm -hmm. And then and the second, yeah, go ahead. Oh, before it deploys, is it running any tests for you? And like, did you set anything up there or it's? Not in this example, mm -hmm. um, but you can, you can run things sort of, if you're doing um, like our package development, if you develop a Shiny app as a package, you can run things like RCMD check in GitHub Actions and sort of put that test in before the deployment. So if that test fails, then it won't deploy, um, for example. Um, the second GitHub action that I added in uh, for this project was the data updates. So the idea is that sort of every day at I think like 8 a.m. it then pulls in the data for the previous day and adds that into this app. So you can see um, on the screen share just now these tweets are coming in from sort of earlier um, this morning. So it's every day it's refreshing that data. And when it's finished that data update, it commits it to Git. Uh, commits it to main, which then automatically triggers that redeploy. So it's sort of, you have those GitHub actions that are kind of independent, but all, but connected at the same time. So when one completes, you've got this data and again, it'll just automatically redeploy. So I don't actually have to do anything at all um, to get my app to update every day. It's sort of doing it automatically. I only ever get an, an email if it breaks. Okay. And we do have a question. Um... Black T asked, have you used GitHub Actions in combination with Shiny Test before? Um, it's something I'm currently working on um, and having a little bit issue, a few issues getting GitHub Actions to work. Um, so I haven't used it in this project. Um, I recently sort of updated to Shiny Test 2. So the idea of Shiny Test 2 is it sort of checks that the outputs of what you think you're displaying in your Shiny app are actually what you expect to be displayed in your Shiny app. Um, and certainly you could do something like that with GitHub Actions. So you run your Shiny Task 2 and you check that your app is what you think it is, and then you push it to main which, and then automatically redeploy is definitely something um, you could do. Um, the way I'm currently doing this in other projects at the moment is sort of trying to integrate Shiny Task 2 with sort of our package checks. So this example of an app is a little bit different from the way I normally build things. Um, this one is sort of not built as an R package. Um, quite often when I'm building Shiny apps, they're built as an R package and it's much easier to sort of add tests in um, to R packages. Um, so you could definitely combine them and then combine those with GitHub Actions, definitely. 
All right. Awesome. Yeah. And so do you want to tell us a little bit about your methodology just for the person who's never built a shiny app before? Like, yeah. Um, when you what, start, what do you start with first and where do you go from there? Yeah. What I'll do is I will, I'll share some code. Um, so if you've never built a shiny app before ever, um, it generally, all shiny apps are, have two components. Um, they have a UI, so a user interface. So this is when someone looks at your app, what do they actually see? And then you have a server file, which contains all of the code with what's happening in the background. Um, so this is um, the UI file for the app um, I showed you. And you can see it's actually a very simple um, UI. There's there's not a lot in here. Essentially, you just have a title. Um, and I sort of added in some theming so to change the color scheme of the app. Um, and then I have this sort of panel here, um, which is a, a reactable. So this is just a table output. So you saw that with the sort of different lines in the app. Um, and that's what someone sees when they look at the app. They see the title and they see that table. If we move over to the server file, this is a little bit messier. Um, but so the server file is essentially telling you what's what's going on in the in the background of the code to actually create that table. Um, and the first thing it's doing is reading in the data file. So rather than sort of doing live, like pulling the data live through the Twitter API, it sort of saves it as a file. And then that file is what's being refreshed every day. So the first thing I'm doing in the server file is reading in that data set. And then I'm constructing that table output here. Uh, OK, so I'm rendering the table. And this is this is not the nicest code. So I do apologize for that. Um, but what this is doing is sort of uh, defining uh, the different columns in that table. So sort of saying, OK, the first column is a date. The second column gives you the users. And I want those links to be to be clickable. I don't just want to be some text that tells me what the, the username is. I want to be able to click on, on that username. And it takes me to their Twitter profile. Um, so that's sort of what, what these lines are doing. And the same with the links as well. I don't just want text for the link. I want a sort of an HTML link that takes me to the tweet or to the link um, that I saw. Mm -hmm. So that's the sort of two components that make up um, the actual Shiny app. And then to actually sort of deploy that Shiny app, um, I created a deploy.r script. So one thing you'll notice is if, the, if you are on either the UI or the server uh, file, R Studio um, is quite smart and it can tell that it's a Shiny app. So what you see is this little button here. And this sort of is the button you click to publish and deploy your Shiny app. Um, and that's absolutely fine if you're doing it manually. But if you're trying to use GitHub Actions to automate that deployment, then clicking a button isn't something you can do. So you have to sort of write a script to deploy it for you. Um, so basically what happens when this script is run is that it publishes um, the Shiny app onto shinyapps.io for me. Okay, so one thing you'll notice here is sort of this line here with the set account info. In order to publish something onto shinyapps.io, uh, you have to authenticate your account to say this is my username and password and sort of log in and be able to deploy it. If you're doing the sort of uh, deployment version where you're sort of clicking a button to deploy it, you know, you, you get a prompt and you can manually type in your username and password and log in. If you're doing it through um, a script, you want to make sure that you're keeping things like your username and password sort of secret. You don't want to be sharing those on, on GitHub. Um, so if I were running this locally, I would have a sort of .r environ file with these the shiny account name and my, my passwords stored in there. If I'm running this with GitHub Actions, you can use GitHub Secrets. So you can create a GitHub secret called shiny account name, and I pass my account name in there. And it's sort of hidden from the code that's on the GitHub repo, so no one knows what it is. Um, but it's sort of stored with, within those GitHub secrets. So those are the kind of the three key components of, of the app is I have my UI script to say, this is what a user sees. I have my server script to say, this is how I'm computing what the user sees. And then I have my deploy script to actually publish uh, my app. Awesome. 
Okay, and you put this up on your website, right? Yeah, so this is all, um, the code for the whole app is up on GitHub. Um, and you can you should be able to see the GitHub Actions file there as well. So I can talk about um, the GitHub Actions process, if that's useful. Mm -hmm. um, so let me just open this up. So the GitHub Actions are always stored in a sort of .github workflows folder. Um, and I have two here. So I'll show you the deploy um, script first. So this is um, the script that runs every time I push my code to main on GitHub. Uh, this gets triggered and this script runs. Um, so the first thing most GitHub Actions file is a name, which is very useful if you have multiple GitHub Actions and one of them breaks, you need to have a sort of useful name so you can figure out which one it is. Um, the second part here is telling you when do you want this GitHub Action to run. So here I'm sort of saying there are three situations where I want um, this to run. I want it to run every time I push to main or master. Mm -hmm. I want it to run every time that data update finishes. Um, and I also, I added in this workflow dispatch, which means that if I go into GitHub and go into the sort of GitHub actions tab, I can click a button and it will manually run that as well. Um, it's not something that sort of manual triggering the GitHub Actions isn't something I use a lot, but it's very useful when you're first setting up those GitHub Actions and you're sort of testing them um, over and over again to sort of try and fix them and make sure they're working properly. It's useful to be able to just click a button and rerun it and retest it. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of the script is sort of what do you actually um, want your GitHub Action to do? Um, so you sort of initially you need to sort of specify um, what the sort of job runs on. So I'm saying use uh, Ubuntu um, 20. And then down here is where the deployment is actually happening. So I'm using um, Docker to actually um, deploy the app. Um, so after I sort of checked out the repository, I want to build a Docker image, execute that Docker script, and then run it. And you can see here, this is quite similar to that deploy script I had um, where I'm accessing the GitHub secrets value of my shinyapps.io account name um, and the passwords there. So I'm passing those GitHub secrets um, into that Docker file, which then automatically deploys uh, to shinyapps.io. I'll talk a little bit about the second GitHub action. Um, so this was the one that was actually a little bit tricky. Um, I found a blog post that was like, how do you deploy shiny apps automatically with GitHub Actions? And I managed to follow most of that blog post and make tiny little tweaks. And it worked sort of first or second time, which I was very impressed with because my code never works first time. <laughs> um, and then I thought, okay, let's do this update data one. And I couldn't really find a blog post or an example of this one. So I had to write this pretty much from scratch and sort of pulling little bits from, from other files. Um, so this one's, the initial part is slightly similar. So we'll give it a name. So let's call it as an update data script. And then again, you specify when you want this job to run. So again, I've added in the workflow dispatch so I can go in and manually click on GitHub Actions to say, run it now. But I also have this schedule. So rather than running it when I push to main or when I do something, GitHub Actions are saying, okay, I'm going to run this on a schedule. And in this example, it's running it every day at 8 a.m. Okay, so this is sort of specifying um, every single day at 8 using the cron. And then we have the sort of the meat of the, the GitHub Actions. So again, sort of in initially quite similar, sort of setting up what's it running on, um, passing in your sort of uh, GitHub secrets and setting up R. And then here we're actually running um, our, our update. So there's a couple of packages I need to use in R in order to be able to do my update data. So the first thing I need to do is install those packages um, into the sort of GitHub Actions. So when it runs, it installs um, this set of packages here. The second thing it does is run a script called update data. Okay, so I have that here. Okay, so 
I sort of load in the packages that I've just installed, and then it runs this uh, update data script. Uh, so the first thing it does is grabs the new data. So it uses uh, this uses the rtweet package, which is um, it's one of my favorite packages um, in terms of sort of our package used for APIs um, because it's sort of our tweet the data can go in both directions. So you can use our tweet to get your own data on tweets that you've liked um, or tweets that you've written, for example. Um, but you can also use our tweet to tweet. Um, so you can send out tweets um, from within our studio, which I think is, is quite awesome. Um, so anyway, yeah, we're using the our tweet uh, package using this get favorites um, function to get um, tweets that I've liked in the in the last sort of day. And then doing a little bit of data processing um, because the get favorites returns a lot of information and I only really want to display a couple of columns on it. So um, mm -hmm. doing a little bit of data processing and then adding it to this file. So it, it looks at the file that was there yesterday, it adds the new data and sort of overrides that file. And you can see here that I'm also using another sort of GitHub secret, um, so I can authenticate the RTweet app. So if you're using the Twitter API, that also needs to be authenticated. Um, and you can do that in the same way that you authenticate uh, your Shiny apps.io account, you can authenticate that using GitHub secrets um, in there. And then awesome. it, it runs this update. Um, I'd love to <clears throat> share the GitHub link to this. Do you, so just asking, um, it almost seems like if we were to update the credentials and the words to keep that there wouldn't be too much work to like repurposing it for something else, right? Yeah, I, I definitely think it would, it would be quite easy to to update this. So in the the update data, you this is probably something you know you you might want to up, update. You could add those as arguments to a function theoretically. So these are specifically. Um, looking for tweets that I have liked. Um, I have also thought about sort of other people at work, for example, that also tweet, you could you could add them and sort of get a nice little data science collection of tweets. And this is sort of filtering um, the specific words that you want. So yeah, I think if you were to sort of clone the repo, update your your secrets and maybe sort of play around with the, the update data function to make sure you're getting stuff that you specifically are interested in, I do think it would be it would be quite easy to to build your own version of it. Awesome. Um, and then so Black Tea had another question. Do you have a recommendation on how to set up a reproducible environment in action scripts? Do you use Renth or do you have another way to do that? So I am not using RN for this. Um, when I'm doing install.packages, it's always installing the latest version from Cran. Um, and as I said, I, sort of, I tend to build Shiny apps as R packages, which by default tend to mostly use the most up-to-date version. Um, mm -hmm. You can use RNV if you want to say, use this particular version um, of a package. How do and you... Oh, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I was gonna say, um, so RNV is, is quite, useful if you're if it's something that you're not going to be looking to update or it's, it's you think it might be complicated to update for me this is a, a very small shiny app so if something in a package updates um it's realistically going to be quite a, usually going to be quite a small job to fix so i tend to just always use the most up-to-date version um for this project mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to ask. So, on other projects, do you sort of force the version to so that you don't have problems with dependencies down the road? Or yeah, so I okay. I would quite often force a minimum version. Um, but typically, if you are building things as R packages, when you're doing anything like GitHub Actions or sort of RCMD check, it's almost always going to be pulling the most recent version. Okay. It's, it's that balance, it's that trade-off is, do you want your code to be new and for any bugs that were in those packages to have been fixed so that those bugs are no longer in your code? But also when when you're using things that are updating regularly, that means more maintenance work. So it's that sort of trade-off between 
ha having things to more things to fix, but having the newest sort of fewer bugs version or having yeah. something that's easier for you to maintain, but might be a little bit outdated and might not always be the best way to do things. It's, it's a balance depending on, on how much time you have, I guess. That's the thing is I'm typically not as willing to maintain. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> um, did you find like, what, what were some of the challenges that you had along the way? So I think most of the challenges I had were with this um, update data. Mm -hmm. It took a lot of um, hitting that button to rerun the GitHub Actions. I had a lot of red crosses um, when I was initially implementing this. Um, it, it was failing quite a few times. It was sort of getting the authentication right. Um, was It tripped me up a little bit because there's a couple of different ways that you can authenticate. Um, the R tweet package. So you can authenticate sort of as a user or you can authenticate as an app. Um, and it took a little while for it to sort of pick up the right one. Um, in this sense, you want to authenticate it as an app. If you authenticate as a user, that sort of lets you tweet things that sort of um, lets you do what you would do if you're sort of sitting on the Twitter app itself. Um, so that took a little bit. Um, one issue I actually still haven't fixed um, is is there sort of this part here. So after I've installed the packages and run my update data um, script, it commits those files to, to Git for me. So it, it adds and commits those files to main, which then triggers that deployment script. Mm -hmm. The issue I have with this is that, let's say I haven't liked anything data science related on Twitter for the last 24 hours. When this runs after the update data script, nothing has changed. So I technically have no commits to make. So then when I try to do git add git commit, this throws an error. It does mean that it doesn't, it doesn't get pushed to main because it's throwing an error. So it doesn't actually break the app because nothing is being redeployed. But I do get an email every time this happens to say, oh, this is broken because there was nothing to commit. Um, mm -hmm. So that is still something I sort of have to figure out. Um, probably an extra step in here that sort of checks whether there's anything and runs this last step of the GitHub action sort of conditionally. Um, but so if you ignore, if you ignore the email at 8 a.m. tomorrow, if there is data science tweets, it's going to redeploy again, right? Without, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's because it's running on a schedule, it will run or try to run every day at 8 a.m. regardless of what's happened the day before. So it's, it's an issue that sort of fixes itself. And also because yeah. because it doesn't trigger that redeploy, if if this GitHub action fails, it's one of those issues that I know I should fix, but nothing bad will happen if I don't fix it. So the motivation to fix it is, is quite low. That's as good as working as far as yes. I'm concerned. <laughs> um, awesome. And so you've built a ton of apps. Can you tell us a little bit about your generative art app and like yes. what were some of the differences between trying to build this app and trying to yeah. build the other one? So let's see if I can, this might have to reload. Hopefully this will work. So I started doing generative art um, just over a year ago. So the idea is that instead of building scatter plots and line charts with um, code in R, we, we build art, we build things that just look pretty. Um, and this is really fun because I'm, I'm quite a creative person and I do kind of like do a lot of like painting and drawing in my free time. And this is sort of that intersection of things that are kind of useful for work, but also things that are fun. Um, and so I started doing generative art. Um, and I think this was maybe actually the first R package I also built from scratch. So I created, awesome. um, a bunch of different sort of generative art pieces. And then I thought, okay, all of these have some parameters that you can change. So let's make these into functions where those parameters are arguments in those functions. Um, and then it's like, now I have a collection of functions. Okay, this is going to be an R package. And then this developed into a shiny app where, so these are sort of five examples of those functions. And these are some of the parameter inputs. Um, so this is, this was quite different um, to the other app in that it was essentially trying to create some 
almost like a user interface for the inputs and outputs of functions. So rather than sort of typing circles and then putting your parameters in, in the console, in here, you sort of input particular uh, values and these are sort of updating automatically. Mm -hmm. The issues that were a little bit different for this one, one was speed. Um, some of these functions um, that I've written for generative art, they're creating sort of hundreds of millions of points, which is very slow to render. Um, so I didn't include all of the, the functions um, as options here. It was sort of, let's figure out which ones are, can make generative art in a reasonable time and use those ones. And then sort of the other ones that just take too long to render because you get really frustrated, at least I do, um, when you're using apps and it takes more than two seconds. I'm like, just hurry up. So it was sort of, <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. So it's like, okay, let's, let's go through and see how long these actually take when you put them in a shiny app. And then are you familiar with um, Jacqueline Nolis's GGIRL package? Yeah, yeah I think it's, that's have a really cool package. Yeah, have you thought about having your generative art made into postcards or no? <laughs> I, I haven't thought about it, but I might be thinking about it now. Um, <laughs> right? Yeah, right? yeah, I think that it might be reasonably easy to include something here that like once you've made a generative art piece that you like, at the moment it has a sort of download button and it downloads a PNG, but Theoretically, you could have another button that links to, to Jacqueline's package and will take you and you can send your generative art to, to someone else. I think that would be, that would be pretty cool actually, I think. Yeah. Yeah. You could have Jacqueline paint a, um, watercolor. Of it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so are you still working on either of these or they're done projects? Um, I think the, the sort of the tweet app is pretty much done other than a couple of issues that I should fix but probably won't yeah. um that one's something that I'm probably going to leave alone for a while um the generative art one is isn't something I've updated recently but I would like to update it I've had a little bit more free time to work on some generative art stuff lately so I have a whole bunch of new functions um that haven't been added in um and I think it would be quite nice to sort of add those in here um, so you hear that a more updated version um, of the Shiny app, yeah. Totally. And Kate loves your background. Excellent, Hi, awesome. <laughs> um, so is there anything that we missed out about these projects that you're hoping to share with people? I or think just, did? yeah, I think the only thing I would say is like, for me, these sort of personal projects is like finding something that you're interested in personally and that you have some motivation to do personally. It, it's nice to do that and also be sort of developing your skills as a developer at the same time. So I've, I had never really written GitHub Actions file before. I was like, oh, I'm going to build a Shiny app to display some tweets. And so now I have I have a nice little Shiny app um, and I have something that I'm personally interested in, but it's also I have developed a whole bunch of, of new skills. So having these kind of personal projects has been really useful for me. Uh, Same. Yeah. yeah. And I've also found that, you know, once I start a project, the ideas just start flowing for projects that I could do in the future. It's like really a cumulative thing. Yeah, absolutely. I think I have a sort of a list of feels like a mile long of, oh, I could do this. And it's just not enough time for all of the projects that are in my heads, right? Yeah, right. There's just not enough time. Oh, so Kate has an interesting question. Can you tell us about your cool data project selection process and why you chose Nicola's project? Um, so I'd say that the selection process is not very scientific. When I see people doing really interesting things, you know, I personally haven't used GitHub Actions and, um, you know, so my computer vision project to detect the boss, I'm running the script and it's just a loop that's just going 24 seven. And so honestly, I see, I see GitHub action CICD and I'm like, oh, that's something that, you know, I could learn about. So I'm assuming other people want to learn about it as well. Um, and then obviously um, she just has some like amazing credentials and has done some awesome work. So that um, that's sort of it as well. But yeah, Kate, thank you for asking. Um, so
So do you have advice for people who maybe want to get started with shiny apps or um, playing with GitHub Actions? Yeah, so if, if you're kind of looking to develop shiny apps and it's something you're not very familiar with, there are a couple of sort of good books I definitely use as reference. So they're sort of mastering shiny um, and there's engineering sort of production grade shiny apps. And I think the thing that's made those easier for me is the R4DS community. Um, so the R4DS have a Slack channel that runs through boot clubs. So you can learn about shiny apps at the same time as other people. And you will probably all have the same questions about how does this work? Why are you doing that? Um, so having that Slack group where you can sort of meet every week with other people learning the same thing is really nice. And also has that Slack channel where you can just post a question and there's sort of, there's like tens of thousands of people in there. Someone will probably know the answer to your very niche question about shiny apps. So I think that was a really good place uh, to get started. Um, in terms of GitHub Actions, for me, I looked at a lot of blog posts because mm -hmm. GitHub Actions isn't something that's R specific. You know, you can use GitHub Actions with sort of any programming language or any project. Um, you might be able to find a blog post that's, let's say, in Python, but you can adapt it to, to work um, with R code as well. Um, there were a couple of talks at um, our studio conference back in July as well that were like, this is how I'm using GitHub Actions with R. And I was like, okay, these are these are things I should remember and go back and watch again um, when I'm sort of actually implementing them. Great, awesome. And Kate has a fun question. If you could change one thing about Ooh. Shiny Apps, what would that be? Oh, that's, that's a very good question. Um, <laughs> Sometimes I find Shiny Apps a little bit um, slower to load. So one of the, another project that was on my list of personal projects recently was I built a Shiny App and I built the same app in Tableau um, and built a Tableau dashboard and they look essentially identical. But the thing that I found was the Tableau dashboard was just quicker to start up, which really sort of surprised me a little bit. Um, so I think sometimes with Shiny, you have to know those sort of little tips and tricks of how do I make it quicker um, and be sort of doing things in the server and rather than in the UI and sort of moving stuff around. Um, so I think maybe if it was more obvious to a user, at least initially, um, how to how to make things quicker. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I feel like Maybe we're getting to the end, but um, obviously people are going to want to find and follow you. So how would they do that? Um, so you can follow me on Twitter or LinkedIn um, or Mastodon as well. Um, but the best place to find all of that information is probably on my website. Um, so my website is just sort of nrenny.rbind.io. And you can find links to where you can find me everywhere else or are all on there. And I, sort of, I do post sort of blog posts regularly, uh, such as the sort of GitHub Actions for Shiny Apps blog posts as well. Awesome. And so after we get off, I will share your um, website and your GitHub on the LinkedIn comments yeah, perfect. So, that people, so that people can find it. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us. This was so thorough with all the code. I really appreciated the demo and, and your willingness to just sort of share everything about the project yeah. i think that this was absolutely awesome thank you that's, that's one of the things i like about the r community is that as soon as we discover something we're sort of must tell everyone about it and share all of your codes yeah. which is a very nice environment to be in yeah awesome well thank you everyone for joining if you are working on a really cool project you can hit me up in the dms um, i'd be happy to chat about it and I look forward to seeing you for the next Cool Data Project show. Have a great day, everybody.